Hi, everyone. I am Jess. For those of you who don't know me, if you've never been to one of my sessions, um, just a quick little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Western myself. I love Western and I love this course. I was actually a TA for this course where I helped mark the uh, past tests um, back in the day when this test was multiple choice and short answer. Obviously, you know, your upcoming tests and exams are all multiple choice this semester, but I'm still going to show you all the tips and tricks that I learned along the way. Um, this semester, the reason why we're doing these weeklies is because I've gotten a lot of requests for private tutoring, and unfortunately, I don't have time to tutor every single person individually. I would love to do that, but instead, I'm going to run these small group tutorials with you guys, and like Robbie said, um, please tell your friends. We're really just here to help you, and I will send you guys that link to the survey in just a second, or later on in the session, actually, um, so you guys can give me feedback. Please write down my email, okay? So you can send me questions if you have them uh, via my email. During these weekly tutorials, my goal is to prepare you for the quiz. So I know your first quiz just closed yesterday, but your next quiz is coming up. Uh, it's opening next Wednesday, I believe. And then you also have a test. So the first weekly or first and second weekly tutorials are gonna be a little bit more crammed just because I wanna catch you guys up before the test. And then after that, I'll slow down a little bit more just to uh, really cover what you guys learned that week in class, okay? If you have questions, drop it in the q and I will answer all of them. And I also, uh, sometimes I'll ask you guys questions, ask you guys for answers. And if you're willing, just raise your hand and then I'll open the mic and you can talk, all right? So today we're gonna aim to cover 1.1 to 1.3. And then next week we'll cover 1.4 to 1.6 and get you guys ready for that quiz and test, okay? So let's get started. You guys should already have a booklet for this week's tutorial. Now, I've broken it down the same way you see it in lecture, the same way you see it in your textbook so that you don't get confused. I always have students asking me, oh, does this correspond to the same thing as what I'm learning in class? Yes, it does, okay? So 1.1 is all about sets. And I'm gonna show you this secret weapon that I've shared with every single student I've tutored, tutored hundreds of students. And honestly, out of all of them, if one student didn't like it, everyone else was like, that's a lifesaver for the test. So I'm gonna show you the secret tool called counting with tables. Then we're gonna dive into 1.2, which is counting with trees. And then 1.3, which is counting with what I call decisions blocks, which is, which is fundamental theorem, uh, or sorry, fundamental counting principle, okay? So let's dive right in uh, section 1.1. So first we need to go through some definitions here because you need them to do these problems, right? So what is a set? Now, a set, I like to think of it as just a shopping cart. It's a shopping cart full of things. Each thing is called an element. But in math, we're not gonna draw out a shopping cart that takes too long. So instead we use these curly brackets. For example, I can have the set A, B, C, an apple, a banana, and a carrot in my shopping cart. I can have the set one, two, three, four, nine, let's say. That's a set. What's important to know in a set, and you have to remember this, there can't be duplicate items in a set like this. So for example, if I have the set A, A, B, C, this is actually the exact same thing as the set A, B, C. We don't count the duplicate items, okay? We just want to know what individual items there are um, that are not duplicated, okay? Um, a universal set, so that's just a typo there, a universal set um, is the set of things that we care about in this question. For example, if the question is talking about Western students, then we don't care about the Queen students, we don't care about U of T students, it's just Western students, okay? We'll see this in action in just a second. And then we have something called the empty set. Of course, you can have an empty shopping cart with nothing in it, right? So it's just curly brackets with nothing inside. Now, this course uh, you saw on the quiz and also for the test uh, coming up, there's not gonna be a lot of questions, if any, that ask you, hey, list out this set. That's almost too easy. Instead, they're gonna ask you to count the number of things inside a set. So that is written as N of your set because N, you know, number, the word number starts with the letter N. So N of S means the number of things inside of S. So we're gonna be counting the number of things inside these sets using tables, using tree diagrams in just a second, okay? Last little thing I'm gonna go over before we look at an example is uh, these definitions, complement, intersection, and union. Now, before I dive into what these things are, I just wanna see a show of hands. I'm gonna have a few different levels here. 
how many of you guys are like, I have no idea what these complement intersection union stuff are, or you can't use them in questions? Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, how many of you guys are like, I kind of understand the definitions, but I can't really use it in the examples all the time. Okay, thank you. Okay, last question, I promise. How many of you guys are like, I get it, like complement intersection union, I understand them, I can use them in questions. Okay, a little bit of a split. Thank you, thank you everyone for voting. I'm gonna go through them. And I want you guys to pay attention to certain things that I'm highlighting and you need to memorize those, okay? So the word complement, the complement of a set is everything that is not in the set. So in the question, they don't necessarily have to say the complement, okay? They don't necessarily have to say complement, oops, one second, um, or they don't have to write A to this little power of C thing. The key words that are gonna show up in the questions are the words not or everything but. Okay, so for example, you have a set of people who like apples. The set of people who don't like apples is the complement because they do not like apples. Here's the word not, right? For intersection, it uses this little symbol. So the intersection between A and B, that is everything that is shared between A and B. So the keywords I want you to look out for are share, overlap, and, and both. If you see these keywords, that's intersection. There's one keyword that a lot of students miss, and that's the word but. But kind of is the word and, but usually they use it for but not or and not, okay? So if you see any of these words, that's intersection. So for example, you have a group of people who like oranges, you have a group of people who like apples. I wanna figure out the group of people who likes both apples and oranges, okay? So it's the people who share the love for both apples and oranges, okay? It's the overlap. And the word but not works the same way. People who like apples, but not oranges. So it's the people who like apples shared with the people who don't like um, oranges. Okay, so it has to be that overlapping part. When it comes to intersection, there's one more keyword that hit or miss. Some years they'll use it um, a lot in quizzes and tests, some years they won't. And those are the words mutually exclusive. If I say that two sets are mutually exclusive, it means that they don't overlap at all. So if the set of people who like apples and the set of people who like oranges are mutually exclusive, that means that there's no one who likes both fruits, okay? So if there's no overlap, that means that the intersection, there's nothing in it. There's zero things inside the intersection, okay? Finally, union. Union has this little U symbol. I like to think of it as union starts with the letter U, so it looks like a U. It has everything that's in A, everything that's in B, and everything that's in the overlapping part, that's in both, okay? So the keywords you're looking for in the questions are the words or, or at least one. A lot of people know that the word or means union, but not a lot of people remember that at least one also means union. I'm gonna show you what I mean in the example to come, okay? But what I mean is, okay, let's say there's a set of people who like apples, set of people who like oranges. Of course, there's people who like both. If I want you to write out the set of people who like apples or oranges, you need to include everyone. If they like at least one of the apples or oranges, we're including them in the union, okay? All right, so that's me babbling about some uh, definitions. Let's try a problem here. So um, usually multiple choice questions, they don't have multi parts, but I've broken this down into A, B, C, D parts just to illustrate each of the different definitions, okay? So we have a universal set U that contains all the integers from one to 10 inclusive. The trick for this course is all the questions, almost all of them are word problems. And it's, you, you kind of have to break down the question. It's really hard for us to answer questions without seeing what's happening. So I'm going to do a lot of drawing things out or writing things out, okay? I'm never just gonna look at the question and expect you to know what the answer is. That's ridiculous, okay? So we're gonna try to draw or write something out. So we know that this set U which is a set, so I'm gonna use curly brackets, is a set of all integers, one to 10. So that's one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10 and including 10. So there's 10 things inside my shopping cart right now. Now, A is a subset of all the odd numbers. So A is another set, so I'm gonna put curly brackets again, 
But this time, there's not going to be 10 things in my shopping cart for A. There's just going to be five odd numbers. The odd numbers are one, three, five, seven, nine. Those are the only odd numbers here. So that's going to be in my shopping cart for A. Finally, B is a subset. So again, we have a set notation of all the numbers that are less than four. Be very careful with the wording less than, greater than, or less than equal to, greater than equal to, okay? So if it's less than four, meaning it has to be just smaller than four. So the numbers that are smaller than four are one, two, and three. Don't include four because four is not less than four, okay? So write out your sets. If they're nice enough to describe to you what the sets are, write them out. Obviously, sometimes in the questions, they'll say, hey, U is the set of all Western students. I can't draw out all Western students. In that case, I won't do it. But if you can, draw it out, write it out. Okay, question A, what is N of A complement? So I wanna find the number of things inside A complement. Some of you guys are really quick and you're like, oh, I can see how many things are gonna be in there. I can't personally, okay? So instead, I'm going to draw out what A complement is. The key is always write out or draw out what the question is asking. So they're looking for A complement. Remember, complement is everything but what's inside A. So everything else. So I'm not gonna include the odd numbers, I'm gonna include all the even numbers. So two, four, six, eight, and 10. And I've seen questions like this show up on past tests, past exams, where this is a possible answer. But I don't want you guys to select that answer because they're not asking for what is a complement. They're asking for what is the number of things inside a complement. So in total, there are one, two, three, four, five things in the shopping cart, so the number inside of a complement is five, okay? So don't select the set, select the number that corresponds to the number of things in the set, all right? Um, a good question came up here. Uh, why are we not including zero in this question? Great question. They are telling us that U is the set that contains all integers from one to 10. So they're not telling us it's from zero to 10. If they said zero to 10, then yes, we'll include zero. But if they don't say that, if they say one to 10, then we're starting from one and we're ending at 10. Another common question, we'll actually see it in later sections, is they'll talk about digits. When they say digits, they mean the digits zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, it's like the numbers on your keypad. In that case, if they say digits, then you include zero. Okay. And just a bonus, and I'll, I'll mention this later on too. So if it's too overwhelming, you can block me out. But um, if it is the question involves digits or the number zero, then remember zero is actually an even number. And a lot of times in the question itself, it'll put in brackets, remember zero is even. They don't, they don't try to trick you there, okay? All right, let's do part B. What is the number of things inside A, this symbol means intersection, intersected with B? Think of your keywords. Intersection means shared or overlap or and, right? So ask yourself, how many things are shared between A and B? What do you think? I just wanna make sure you guys are still with me. If you know the answer, type it in the chat or Q&A. How many things are in the intersection of A and B? Thank you, thank you, yes. Thank you, thank you, okay. So A and B, there's two things here, right? There are two sets here. Now, in shopping cart A, there's one. In shopping cart B, there's one. So that's shared. In shopping cart A, there's three. In shopping cart B, there's three. Oh, notice that in shopping cart B, there's also this two that doesn't show up anywhere else. It doesn't show up in A. So there's only two things that they have in common, two things that they share. So the answer here is two, okay? If you wanted to write it out, A intersect B, you could. I didn't draw it out because I already have the mental picture above, right? But if I didn't, I would draw it out. So A intersect B, that's sharing between the numbers one and three only, okay? So the number inside the intersection is uh, two. All right, oops, let me just fill that back in. All right, thanks for participating, everyone. Cool, okay. Uh, now let's take a look at part C. How many numbers are in B, but not A? So remember, this word, but, is actually an intersection. So what they're looking for 
is the number, uh, how many numbers are in B, but not A, so intersected with A complement. They're looking for this, okay? So again, I'm gonna go back up. If you want, you can copy those sets uh, into this question, but since I have them here, I'm just gonna use them. So I'm looking at B and I'm looking at A complement. I'm looking at the intersection, meaning what's shared between them. So look at each number, which number appears in both of these sets, which numbers are shared. Write down the answer here. Mm -hmm, yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. There's only one number that's shared, right? The number two. <laughs> yes, thank you. The number two is shared between these, these two guys. That's the only number that's shared between them. So um, oops. the number that is in B but not A, that's one. There's only one number. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Okay, part D says how many numbers are in A or B? When you see the word or, I need you to remember that it means union. Another way to phrase this question, because in my earlier session, some students asked like, how else can they word this question? They technically could word it as how many numbers are in at least one of A and B, or A or B, okay? If you see at least one, that means they're talking about, okay, if it belongs to A, it's good. If it belongs to B, it's good, we're gonna count it. If it belongs to both, we're gonna count it. Okay, that's what they mean. So when it comes to unions, what we're gonna do is really just list everything that's in one set, everything that's in the other, but make sure we're not counting any duplicates. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll back up for a second here. A and B are over here. Let me just erase these. Oops, my screen is getting crazy. One second, oh, whatever. Okay, so A and B, are these guys. If I'm looking at the union, I'm literally copying out everything that's in A. So one, three, five, seven, nine, copying out everything that's in B. So that's one, two, three, but then removing all the duplicates. So one showed up twice. I don't want that. So I'm going to get rid of that. Three showed up twice. I don't want the second three. So I'm going to get rid of that as well. Oops. So this is it. This is my set. One, three, five, seven, nine, two. So we can see that there are six things in it. So A union B, the number of things inside of there is going to be six, okay? So here, the number inside A union B is six. Okay, now I'm gonna let you guys try part E, but I'm gonna help you get started with it. Sometimes you'll see really messy expressions where there's like brackets within brackets. Don't let that bother you. Follow your normal like math bed mass, right? We always deal with brackets first, then exponents, remember all that stuff? So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna deal with what's inside this bracket first, and then you're gonna deal with this exponent called the complement, okay? So I want you to figure it out. Write out what is A complement union B, and then find the complement of that and count how many things are in there. Okay. When you think you have an answer, if you don't mind just raising your hand, just so I know how many of you guys have tried the question.
Awesome, amazing. A lot of people have finished. I know some of you guys are still working on it. That's okay. That's why we're doing these practice, right? But since a good number of you guys have completed this question, let's take it up real quick. Okay, so we're dealing with this bracket first. So A complement union B. Remember, union is like everything that's in there. So I'm going to write out everything that is in my A complement. I just need to scroll back up because I can't see both at the same time. But A complement is all the even numbers, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so I'm going to write those all out. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Oops, I'm not going to close it off actually. And then I'm going to write out everything that's in B. So if I go back up, B, that includes the numbers 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to write out 1, 2, and 3. But then I need to get rid of things that are duplicated. So this number two shows up twice. I'm going to get rid of it. Cool. This is a complement union B. But we're not done. We need the complement of that. So a complement union B, the complement of that, meaning everything else, everything that's not in this set. Well, there's the number one, number two, number three, number four. There's no number five. So I'm going to write that down. There's a number six. Oh, there's no number seven. There's a number eight, but there's no number nine, and there's a number 10. So A complement union C complement is actually five, seven, and nine. So the number of elements there is three. So again, I don't want any of you to make the mistake that I've seen students make when I was marking these. If the multiple choice question gives you the option of selecting the set five, seven, nine versus the number three, you are selecting the number three because they're asking for the number of elements in the set. Okay, don't make that mistake. All right, so that's a definition type question. But now let's get to the juicy meteor of things, which is the types of questions that will show up more frequently on the test and your quiz as well. Um, first, there's the set properties. Don't memorize these. They will never, I've never seen it in all my years. Um, I've never seen them ask, hey, is this set property correct? They, they don't do that, okay? Don't worry about the set properties. They're there for you if you want to. And a lot of them you can actually reason out using those keywords. For example, this one right here. The keyword for the intersection is and, right? So you can think of this as A and B, an apple and an orange. That's the same thing as an orange and an apple, right? The order doesn't matter. Same with or, apples or oranges versus oranges or apples, they're the same thing. So a lot of these you can actually reason out using words. So don't, don't memorize these. Instead, we're gonna focus on the main types of questions they're gonna ask. And before I talk about this table, actually, when do we use it? If you encounter a question that involves two sets, like AB, EF, something like that, or two attributes, meaning they take calculus and they take algebra, or they like oranges, they like apples, okay? Two sets or two attributes, there's quite a few questions like that on the test. You're gonna use this table. This is like my secret weapon that I give students. <laughs> so this table helps us organize all the information in the question. So let's quickly talk about how this table works. You need to memorize how to draw this table, but we're gonna do a lot of practice that hopefully will start, it'll stick after today. We have the columns A, a complement and its total. Then we have the rows B, B complement and total. Now, the total of the totals in a question would be the universal set, right? It's everything we care about is the total of the totals. So that is actually going to go right here because that is the totals of the totals. Okay, so that goes right there. Let me get rid of these arrows here. Now let's figure out what the rest of these blocks mean. Well, this square over here, this box, if you look at it, it's in the A column and the B row. So it's actually the intersection between A and B. Oops, what's happening? Okay, let me just get rid of that. So this is the intersection between A and B, or B intersect A, order doesn't matter. This box here, think about what this one would be. It's the intersection between which two things? Well, it's in the A complement column and the B row, right? So this one is actually 
A complement intersected with B. The other two squares should be the same idea, right? This square here is in the A column, B complement row. So this is A intersected with B complement. This last one is the number that is inside A complement intersected with B complement. Okay, so that's where these numbers go. And I know it sounds complicated right now, but once we see an example, you're gonna love this table, I promise. And now what happens is with this table, every row adds up to the total on the right. Meaning if I add up these two squares, I'm gonna end up with this square over here. And guess what that square is? That is the total of B, meaning the number of things inside of B. Same thing with the second row. If I add up these two squares, I should end up with this square. And this square is the total of B complement. So it's N of B complement like that. Okay, let's get rid of some of these. And in this table, the columns add up to the total at the bottom, okay? So meaning if I add up these two squares, they should add up to this box at the bottom there. And that box is the total of A. So what goes down there is the number that's inside of A. So number of A. By the same logic, this is number of A complement, okay? So just know that in this table, once you organize your information from the question, the numbers always add up to the number on the right, and the numbers always add up to the numbers at the bottom, okay? Um, there's one more uh, trick to this table, and that is the four middle squares have to add up to the total of totals, meaning if you add up these four middle squares, you'll end up with this number, okay? Trust me, it's going to be more intuitive than it looks right now. Let's actually dive right in and do a problem. I'll come back and talk about um, a few more notes in a second. But page five, I want to do question number two with you guys. So this is a very typical question that shows up usually as the first question on test one. So here we have the number of things inside of A is 20. So that's one set, A. The number of things inside A complement and B is five. Oh, so that's two sets. I have a set B as well. The number of things inside A intersected B complement is two. I'm still just at two sets, A and B. We want to find the number of things inside of B. So we're stuck at two sets. So guess what? We can use the table when it's two sets. So I have A, A complement, total, B, B complement, total. When there's only two sets, we can use our handy table. I know in class they use tree diagrams, Venn diagrams, all of that, but the table actually is a lot easier for these types of questions. Okay, so once you figure out it's one of those table questions because, oops, sorry, because um, there's only two sets, then you draw the table and then we can start filling it out. So it says if n of a is 20. So the total number of things inside of a is 20. So total of a, that brings me down to this box down here. That's 20. So I fill that out. I'm going to cross it off from the question. Then I have a complement intersected with b. There's five things in there. So I'm going to look for a complement and I'm going to look for b and the box that's in the overlap that's going to be five. And then we have A intersected with B complement. So I'm going to look for A and I'm looking for B complement in the box that's crossed over by those two. There's a number two inside. And we want to find the total number that's inside of B. So I'm looking for this box here. So remember, in these types of tables, the numbers always add down to the bottom and they add to the right. Okay. So I need your help. How can we find this question mark here? Any ideas? If you have an idea, type it in the Q&A, or if you wanna talk, just raise your hand and then I'll uh, unmute your mic. You guys are a little shy, eh? Good, I'm seeing some answers. Yes, thank you, thank you. Amazing. You guys aren't shy. You guys just don't like to talk. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So I'm seeing a lot of suggestions uh, for this box here, I'm assuming. 
So this missing box here, well, I know that this box plus two has to add up to 20. So I can just go do the reverse, 20 minus two, which is my 18. And then now I can just add across 15 plus, or sorry, 18 plus the five is gonna give me this missing box. 15 plus five, that's 23, okay? So the answer here is 23. Thank you everyone who helped me out. So the table is really nice that way. You don't have to think about any of your rules or anything. You just use the fact that every row and column adds up to the total, okay? Obviously, sometimes we can't fill out the entire table. For example, these guys, these missing four boxes, there's no way we can fill it out and that's okay because the question is not asking for it, okay? All right, let's take a look at the next question. Actually, sorry, before we do that, notice that this question only had to do with the number inside of A, number of B, and the intersection. There was no mention of unions. So I'm gonna go back up to the last page and make a note about union real quick. Let's get rid of this. Okay. So what do we do when we encounter unions? Well, think back to the last problem we did, sorry, the, the one on the previous page. When it came to union, we copy down everything that's in A and copy down everything that's in B, and then we just did remove the duplicates, right? That's kind of what we're gonna do here. Inside the middle four boxes, we're going to highlight everything that's inside A and highlight everything that's inside B. Notice that only three boxes get highlighted and that's always gonna be the case, okay? You're just gonna add up those three boxes. So for unions, you are going to highlight, I call it highlight, you can mentally highlight as well, three boxes, then add them up. So if I'm looking for the number inside A union B, I would highlight those three yellow boxes that are on the screen right there and then add them up, okay? So let's dive in and let's take a look at the next question that probably will include union. So now we have a word problem, but same idea. We're gonna read the question, pay attention to your keywords and see if it has two sets or two attributes. So we have a record store that sells rock albums and jazz albums. So that's two sets right there. But I don't know, there could be a third set. Let's keep reading. The store sold albums to 50 of its customers where 40 of them bought rock albums, 15 bought both rock and jazz albums and one customer didn't buy anything. So I only see rock and jazz, so that's two sets. So we can use our tables. Instead of using A and B, try to use the first letter of whatever those sets are. So rock would be R and not rock. And there'll be jazz for uh, J for jazz and J complement for not jazz. And I want you guys to fill out the table using the information from the question. Okay, I'll give you guys a minute or so to do that. If you're quick and you have the table filled out, try to use the total of the rows and columns to fill out the whole table. You should be able to do it for this one. Mm -hmm. Good, some of you guys are answering the questions already. That's awesome. I'm going to ask you guys for that in a sec. Okay, I'm still at the table stage, so I want to see what you guys have for the table so far, okay? So you go through the question, and the questions don't trick you. The profs, Vicky is the course coordinator. She's not trying to trick you. 
Okay, so the question, if they're given uh, you a word question like this, a word problem, just read from the beginning. I see a lot of students jumping around, like looking at the 40, looking at the 15, start at the first number. So the store sold albums to 50 of its customers. So where does this 50 go? I labeled my table one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where does this 50 go? Can you guys help me out? Either use the chat or the, the Q&A. Which box does the 50 go in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. A lot of people are saying nine. Some people are guessing it's nine. Have confidence in yourself. Yes, there's. they sold it to 50 of its customers. So the total number of customers that we're looking at here is 50. So that goes in the total of totals, which is box nine. Amazing. Okay. Where 40 of them bought rock albums. So where does the 40 go? Which box? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Help me out. Type it out. Forty of them bought rock albums. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So this one, they're saying rock albums, but they don't mention anything about jazz. Common mistake that I've see, seen students make is they assume they're like, oh, they didn't mention jazz, so it must be not jazz. So I'm gonna put it in box two because box two is rock and not jazz. Don't do that. If they don't mention jazz, that means that it can be in either jazz or not jazz. Okay. So they're saying that. 40 bought rock albums, meaning the total number of people who bought rock, that goes down here. Okay, box three. Some of you guys got that, that's amazing. And then this one, this next one, we have 15 bought both rock and jazz. So when we see the word and and both, those are both keywords for intersection, right? So I'm looking for the intersection of rock and jazz. Which box is that? Yes, thank you. Good, 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 good. Okay, box one is rock and jazz, R and J. So 15 goes here. And then finally, one customer didn't buy anything. So if they didn't buy anything, that means it's going to be not rock and not jazz, okay? So that's gonna go down here. So there's our table. And then I, this table is actually really nice because we can fill out everything in the table. For example, box number two here, well, that, whatever number that is, plus 15, has to add up to 40. So we can do the opposite, 40 minus 15. So that gives us our 25. Same thing with uh, box six, for example. I can just do the opposite, 50 minus 40, to get that missing 10. And then box four, you can do this in a lot of different orders. I'm just filling it out just so that we have the same table going on. Box four, I know that box four plus box five has to equal box six because adding downwards, right? So I know that nine plus one is our 10. And then for the totals, I can just add across. 15 plus nine, do a little bit of mental math because you're not allowed a calculator, that's 24. And then adding across here, 25 plus one, that's 26. And another reason why I really like this table is you can confirm your answers, you can check. For example, I can go down this way and see that 24 plus 26 is 50. So I did it right, this table is correct. Now using this table, I want you guys to answer the questions. So I'm going to open up a poll here. Just give me one second. There we go. Part A, how many of the store's customers bought jazz albums, but not rock albums? Select the correct answer you think it is. Jazz, but not rock. A lot of people voting, that's great. Awesome, thank you everybody. We got a 100% correct answer here. Everyone answered B, that's correct, because jazz and not rock, that's this box right here, so there's nine people, okay? Okay, I'm gonna launch the quiz again. I want you guys to answer part B now. Uh, there we go. How many of the store's customers bought jazz or rock albums? Be careful with your keywords this time. Jazz or rock. And I know we're practicing, but don't use a calculator. I want you guys to really work on that mental math, okay? 
jazz or rock? What do we do with an or? What's the key word there? Mm -hmm. Just to add a little pressure to you guys, I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds. Okay, thank you. Awesome. So jazz or rock, in this case, the or is our union. And remember the trick with union is you're gonna highlight three of the middle boxes. We're not gonna randomly highlight, but we're gonna highlight everything that's in jazz. So out of the four middle boxes, these two boxes are in the J row. And then everything that's in rock, these two boxes are in the R column. So we're adding up those three numbers, okay? So 15 plus 25 is 40, 40 plus the nine is 49. So the answer is C, okay? So that's the table method that I love to show my students because it's, it's a lot easier that you don't have to think about formulas and stuff like that. So just to see a show of hands, um, how do we feel about this table method? Who is like, Great, like I get it. I can do all these questions. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you guys are like, okay, maybe I can do the questions. Like it seems good, but I might need more practice. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So overall, it seems like the table method's good, right? So let's do a few more questions with them. So in question four here, we have a universal set has subsets E and F in it. Okay. So there's two sets so far. There's a universe, of course, but then there's E and F. So right off the bat, I know, oh, only two sets. I'm gonna draw me a little picture. So E, E complement, F, F complement, total. Honestly, if you remember how to draw the table and you know when to use it, these questions shouldn't be too bad. Obviously there's gonna be some tricks here and there, but we'll go through them together. Once you have the table, I want you to fill it out, okay? There's not that many numbers to fill out, so I'm gonna start taking it up with you guys. So N of U, so the number in the universal set is 40. So the total of the totals is 40, that goes down here. E intersected with F. I'm looking for the E column and the F row. There's two inside that box. So these guys are done. And then we have E complement intersected with F complement. So I'm looking for the E complement column, F complement row. That's 15. By the way, the order doesn't matter. If you wanted to put your E's on the right and then your F's on top, that's totally fine. You can switch up the orders. I just put them in alphabetical order usually like that. So this table is looking a little empty, right? And there's really not much we can do to fill out the rest of the numbers. There's not enough information, but that's okay. Let's see what the question's asking for. It's asking for E union F. Remember unions, I'm highlighting three boxes in the middle. That's what we're doing. So E union F, I have to highlight all the boxes that involve E and all the boxes that involve F in the middle. So E is over here, so these two boxes are E. F is over here, so these two boxes are F. So there's our three highlighted boxes right there. Wait a second, we're missing too much information. I'm missing two of the numbers. So there's no way we can figure out what it is. Like we can't just guess. So here is where you can treat them like question marks. We don't know what they are, or you can use a little bit of algebra. I like to use algebra personally. It helps me organize things. I'm gonna give these some variables X and Y because I don't know what they are. I don't know what these numbers are. So what can we do here? How can we find what those three highlighted boxes are? Meaning what is two plus X plus Y? That's what we're looking for. Any ideas? If you have an idea, type it out or raise your hand and I can give you the mic. What can we do? Hmm. 
gonna scroll back up just a second, okay, to, to give us a hint here. Going back to page four when we first saw this table, there's three notes about what we can do with this table. We can add up the rows and they should add up to the right hand side. We can add up the columns, they should add up to the number at the bottom. Or we can add up the four middle squares to end up with the total of totals. So going back to our question. Well, there's nothing in my totals on the right, totals on the bottom, so we can't use the first two bullet points, but we do have the total of totals. So if I write this out, we now have two plus X plus Y plus 15, the four squares in the middle have to add up to 40. Well, I don't care about what X or Y are. I care about what is two plus X plus Y because that is the union, right? That is E union F. I care about that. So I can solve this equation, right? The only thing that's in my way is this 15. So let's subtract 15 from both sides. And now we have two plus X plus Y, which is what we're looking for, equals 40 minus 15, which is 25. Okay, so know your three things you can do with your tables. So the answer here is going to be three. This one's trickier. Okay, if there's questions, let me know, but I'm gonna move on to the last question of this section and then we're gonna go on a short break, all right? So in this question, we have a survey of 43 people. So we'll, let's do this one together. So we know the total of totals, there's 43 people. So we care about these 43. 30 are right-handed, so that's one set. And 20 play basketball, that's another set. Six of the people are left-handed. Ooh, so that might be another set. So you might be thinking, Jess, we can't use the table because there's three sets here. But be very careful with the wordings with these set problems. The opposite of right-handed is left-handed. So instead of calling this L, we're actually just gonna call this our complement. They like to do the same thing with male and female. So they might say there's 30 males, 25 females, something like that. But just remember, male complement is female, okay? Same with left-handed, right-handed. Okay, so indeed there are only two sets here, right? Because six people, the last sentence here was six of the people are left-handed and play basketball, or baseball, sorry. And then we want to determine the number of people that are either right-handed or play baseball. So there's two sets. If there's two sets, we can use a table. Oops. R, R complement total. B, B complement total. And let's start filling it out. Just to speed it up a little bit, I'm gonna fill it out with you, but let me know if there's questions, okay? So again, these 43 people, these are everyone that we care about for this question. So that's the total of the totals. I'm gonna to cross it off. Then we have 30 of them are right-handed and 20 play baseball. Now, because there's two separate numbers here, these are two separate uh, sentences or two, sorry, two separate pieces of information. Some people would think, oh, 30 are right-handed and play baseball. So they, they might think it's R intersect B, but that's not the case because there's numbers in front of each piece. There's two separate pieces of information. So 30 are right-handed. They don't mention anything about baseball. So don't make the assumption, okay? 30 are right-handed. That just means the total of the right-handed people, there are 30 of them. So the total of R is 30. Same thing with the 20 play baseball. They don't mention anything about right or left-handed. So we're just gonna put that in the total of baseballs, the total for B. And then six of the people are left-handed and that's a key word, play baseball. Notice the difference between this sentence and the last one. There's no number before the play baseball, meaning that is all one piece of information. So there are six people who are left-handed and they play baseball. So it's our complement intersected with B. So our complement intersected with B, a six goes there. And that's all the information they're giving us. I'm gonna first fill out the rest of the table because it looks like I have enough information before I answer the question, mine as well. So this box over here, this first box in the top left, I know that that plus six has to be 20. So I can work backwards, 20 minus six, that's gonna be four. Work backwards to find this box. Well, 
30 minus 4 is 26, so that has to go there. And then I can use my total rows and column as well. So this guy over here, 30 plus something is 43. Work backwards, 43 minus 30, that's 13. We can work backwards in this column. 6 plus something is 13. Mm, that something has to be 7, right? Because 13 minus 6 is 7. And then finally, this last total guy is 26 plus 7. That gives us 33. And we can check our answer as well. Um, oh, did I do something? What did I do here? So I noticed right away I did something wrong because my totals don't add up. I just have to, oh, found out where it is. Sorry, guys. No one, no one stopped me. I'm sorry. This is totally my fault. The first number I filled out, this shouldn't be a four, right? This should be a 14 because 14 plus six is 20. So sorry about that. So we have to go back and adjust some of these numbers. Just give me a sec to, uh, okay. So adjusting these, that's a 16. That was a 13. There we go. So that's a, another way that this table really comes in handy. If you made like a mistake that I did, um, you'll notice, you'll catch yourself being like, wait, these numbers don't add up to the totals. Then you can go back and check. Thank you for pointing that out, the 14 mistake. Okay. Now let's answer the question. We want to determine the number of people that are either right-handed or play baseball. So I see the word or, this I need you to just brute force memorize this, or means union. Okay, so I'm looking for the union. When I'm looking for union, I need to highlight the boxes in the middle. So I'm looking for right-handed. So the boxes in the middle that involve right-handed are the 14 and the 16. And the boxes in the middle that involve baseball are the 14 and the six. So those are my three highlighted boxes and I'm gonna add them all up. So 14 plus 16 plus six. 14 plus 16, if you wanted to cheat a little bit, you could have used the fact that they add up to 30 to save yourself some work. So 30 plus six, that's 36. So the answer is going to be C, all right? Okay, so that's section one, counting with uh, tables, a lot of definitions there. Let's take a short break. Um, because the session isn't too long, it's only two hours, is it okay if we do a five minute? This, this, recording, this session is going to be recorded. So if you need a little longer, feel free to take it, but we're gonna come back in five minutes. So let's say resume at um, six, what would that be? 34, let's say, six or 34. And I'm also going to put the survey in the chat message. And I really, really appreciate it if you guys can fill out the survey because then it'll help us make the session even better for you guys next week, okay? So I just post it in the chat. It literally, the morning group said it took them like 30 seconds to fill out. So if you can quickly fill that out for me, I really appreciate it. If you have questions, just let me know in the q and I'll be here to answer them. All right, everyone, we are coming back and moving on with our um, tutorial here. So if you haven't filled out the survey, please fill it out at some point, like it's still open after the tutorial, because in there, there's a really important question asking you guys for your preferred time. We haven't finalized the time yet. We're thinking for the rest of the semester, tutorials will be on Wednesday. Um, but we need to figure out what's the best time for everyone. So um, let us know what the best time is. And if you have friends who didn't attend today's session, bring them next week and ask them the same question. Let them know, hey, the time hasn't been finalized, but we want to see what works best for most people. Okay. All right. Uh, the next section here, these are homework questions. I will send you guys the full solutions. It's just for you guys to try out to do some extra practice there. And if you have any specific questions about them, feel free to email me. I can help you with it. But we are going to continue on page eight, which is section 1.2, counting with trees. A lot of cross focus on this in class. I know that. Okay. All right. So trees, what are these trees? First, I'm actually going to go down and show you when we need to use this before we talk about the trees themselves. So trees are used when you have three or more sets or attributes. So for example, if you have the sets A, B, and C, or if you have the sets of people who like apples, bananas, and oranges, or if you have people who are right-handed, play baseball, or take math, those are three sets or three attributes, right? Technically, this works for more than three sets, it works for four sets, five sets, but I've never seen them give you a question on the test or exam that has more than three sets. 
That's why I'm asking you to focus on three, okay? That's when you use a tree like this. So how does this tree work? Well, this tree starts at the beginning. This is called a root. I don't care if you know the names of this, I'm not gonna ask you that. You can call this a dot, the starting point, a root, whatever the case may be. And what happens is every element, so if you're talking about Western students, every Western student will start at a root and end up at one of these terminal points. They will end up at one of the end points, okay? So let's go through how this tree works. If you're going down a certain path, that represents intersection. For example, if I want to represent A intersected with B, or if I know that the number of elements inside A intersected with B is like five or something like that, then I start at my beginning at the root and I go down A and I go down B. The number that shows up here is A intersected with B. If I wanted A intersected with B intersected with B complement, for example, I will start at the beginning, go down A, go down B, and then go down C complement. That number is gonna show up right here, okay? So intersection, you're just going down a path. That's intersection. How about unions? If you're looking at unions, you're gonna have to add up multiple paths. And it's gonna become more clear once we actually see an example later on, but just know that unions, you're adding up multiple paths. It's just like in the table, union, we're adding up three numbers. Unions in a tree, you're adding up multiple paths. And this next one is very important. It's wordy, but I'm gonna read it to you and explain what that means. It says, the sum of numbers of elements of all branches at each stage must equal to the number of elements of the branch at the previous stage. That sounds really complicated, but it's actually not. So I'm gonna show you with an example again. I'll just get rid of this stuff. So if I'm looking at a group of branches, for example, this branch and this branch, these are a group. This is a group of branch that comes out of this set B, right? These two numbers, whatever they are, have to add up to the number before it. So those two numbers have to add up to whatever is here. If I take, for example, these branches, B and B complement down here, they both came from this A complement, right? So they have to add up to this number right there. So that's all it's saying. The numbers on the uh, branches have to add up to the previous ones. So just to step it up one more level, let me erase some stuff. I'm just not letting me erase. My notes being clunky here for some reason. But if I have, for example, these four branches here, the numbers that are on these four branches, they have to add up to these two numbers, right? Whatever these are. And those two numbers have to add up to whatever is on A complement. So then I know that these four numbers will have to add up to what's A complement, okay? So the adding of branches works down the paths. Okay, let's uh, take a look at some examples. So question number one here, given this counting tree below, we wanna determine the number of elements that are in A complement union C. Before I show you where A complement union C is, let's try to use the fact that the branches have to add up to the previous branch to fill out this table as much as possible. So we start off with 70 people, let's call them people. 50 of them go towards A. Well, the rest of them have to go somewhere, so they have to go towards A complement. That's why this number is going to be 20, 70 minus 50, okay? So 50 plus 20 add up to 70, they add up to the branch before. Now, if I go up here, from this 50, 20 of them goes towards B. The remaining 50 minus 20 has to go towards B complement. So this number is 30. Go ahead, fill out the rest of this table as much as you can. You might not be able to fill out some of the branches, but that's okay. If you're done filling up the, the tree as much as you can, just raise your hand just so I know you're done. And don't panic if you can't fill up the whole tree, that's, that's normal.
I'll give you a hint. From what I have on the screen here, you should only be able to fill out two more numbers and that's it. So if you fill those out, just raise your hand so I know you're done. Thank you. Okay. I think I have half or just over half, so I might start taking it up. Sorry if I don't give you guys enough time. I'm really, um, I just want to make sure I cover, you know, everything that I need to so that next tutorial I'm able to cover everything you need for the test. Okay, so I'm gonna start taking this up now. So we have these numbers already. Starting from here, I'm going to look at this 20 that is from B. And this 20, these 20 people, they have to go towards C and C complement. Well, 15 already went towards C complement. So the remaining five has to go over here, 20 minus 15. And I can do the same thing with this 30. Two of them went down here. So the remaining 30 minus two, which is what, 28, they have to end up over here. And if I look at the branch down here, well, I know that there's 20 that went towards A complement, but out of this 20, I don't know how they're gonna spread themselves amongst B and B complement. I don't know if it's gonna be a 10-10 situation. I don't know if it's gonna be a one versus 19. So we can't guess. So I'm not gonna write it, that's it. This is all we can do with this table. We can't fill out anything else, okay? Now we wanna determine the number of things that are inside A complement, union C. Now think back to our very first question that we did together. When I was trying to figure out A complement union something, I wrote down everything that's in A complement, wrote down everything that's in C, and then just remove the duplicates, right? That's exactly what we're gonna do here. So looking at A complement, start at the beginning, A complement is down here. That means it also already includes all of these branches. All these little ones are already included in this 20, okay? And then I want to highlight the branches that are in C. So there's this one over here, this one, this one, and this one. So there's four of these end branches that have C in it. But be very careful. I don't need to add this one or this one because these two are already included in 20, right? Remember, we don't count any of the duplicates. We're not allowed to have duplicate things in our shopping cart. So I'm not gonna count those ones, but I am gonna add on this five and this 28 because these ones haven't been included in our shopping cart already, okay? So then the number of elements that are in A complement union C is the 20 plus the five plus the 28. And doing a little bit of mental math, what is this? This gives us 25 plus 28. So that's uh, 53, okay? So that's how tree diagrams work. Now there's a big common question that they ask on every single test one without fail. And that's a giant word problem that involves trees. But in the past, they usually put this in the short answer section. So it's actually worth more than one mark. This year, obviously, there's no short answer. This year, it's all multiple choice. So my guess would be they would make you draw a tree for it, but then they'll ask you multiple questions based on that tree. That's just my guess based on um, what I know about this course in the past test. Okay. So let's read this question together. We have in a survey of 82 children, so there's 82 people. At this point, I don't know if this is a table question, if this is a tree question, I don't know yet, but I know there's 82 people is my total of totals. 40 don't eat apples. Okay, apples, that's one set. 17 eat blueberries, but not apples. Okay, blueberries, that's another set. So we have at least two. Then we have 10 eat cookies and blueberries, but not apples. Okay, now I have set three happening. So since there's three sets, automatically I know, okay, it has to be a um, tree. Even if it ends up being four sets, it's still a tree, okay? So I'm going to draw my tree. I'm not gonna finish reading the question because there's no point in me reading it because I'm gonna have to read it again to fill up my tree. So the instant I know whether this is a table or tree question, I'm gonna draw it out. So this is a tree, so I'm starting here. I have my A, A complement, then I have my Bs. So we have B, B complement, B, B complement. Then we have our cookies, our Cs. So C, C complement, C, C complement, C, C complement. It's very symmetric. Okay, 
Now I can go back and read the question. And again, I've mentioned this before. Don't jump around. They're not trying to trick you. Do the question or read the question from start to finish in that order. Okay, so I'm going to just erase everything here. And as I write down the numbers, I'm going to cross them out. So start from the beginning. Don't jump around. Don't start with 16. Don't start with 12. Start with the first number, which is 82. This survey has 82 children. So that's the total of totals. It goes right at the beginning. Cross that out. Okay, moving on. 40 don't eat apples. They mentioned nothing about blueberries and cookies. We just know that the don't eat apples, meaning the A complement branch should be 40. So I'm gonna put that down in this A complement branch, 40. Now the next number, we have the 17. We're gonna try to put that somewhere. 17 eat blueberries, but not apples. Remember, but is an intersection. That is a key word for intersection. Not apples is a complement. So since it's intersection, I'm going to go down a branch. Notice that they flip the order. Our tree diagram is in alphabetical order. A comes first. That's okay. Just mentally flip it. B intersected with a complement is the same thing as a complement intersected with B. So I'm going to go down a complement, then go up to B, and there is my 17. Now we cross it off so we don't have to see that number again. And the next one, we have 10 eat cookies, so that's C, and that's intersection, blueberries, that's B, but not, so again, that's intersection, apples, A complement. So that one's very clunky, but in your head, rearrange it into alphabetical order. That's A complement, B, then C. So you're going to go down A complement, B, then C, put a number 10 right there. And then cross off that number so that you don't accidentally come back to it again. And I know it's going to be harder because the test is online. Um, if you have an on-screen writer, you could cross things out, highlight things. If not, I would just make a note on a piece of paper with the numbers that you already jotted down so you don't come back to them. Okay, this next part, three eat only cookies. Where is that going to go? They didn't mention anything. Did they mention anything about apples and blueberries? Where does this go? Three eat only cookies. I need your help here. If you think you know what this means, where this number goes, type it out in the Q&A, the chat, or you can raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. So we're on this right here, three eat cookies, or sorry, three eat only cookies. So I'm seeing some answers here. Just give me one sec. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Getting some good help here. So be very careful with the word only. When they're saying only, it means that they're not doing anything else. Okay, yes, thank you, thank you. Only cookies means that they're only eating cookies and they're not eating anything else, meaning not apples, not blueberries. So this is, oops, sorry, A complement, B complement, and it's intersections in between because it's they're not eating apples and they're not eating blueberries and they're eating cookies. So that means only cookies, okay? So then I'm gonna go down the path, A complement, no apples, B complement, no blueberries, and C. So that's going to be the number three right there. Okay, and then I cross that off. So be very careful with the words only. If they say only, that means we can assume that they're not doing anything else. That's how they get you on these tests with the wording. Okay, let's keep going. 12 eat apples and cookies. Now they didn't say only. So if they said 12 eat apples and cookies, we actually don't know anything about blueberries. If they said 12 eat apples and cookies only, then we know they didn't eat blueberries, but they didn't say that. So we can't assume that they didn't eat blueberries. So all we know is that A intersected with C is 12. So if I look at my branches, 
if I go down A, then I don't know anything about blueberries, meaning I have to consider both of these cases. And then I'm going to go down cookies, go down C. So notice that there are two paths here. I don't know what each path should have as a number, but I know that they should add up to 12. I can't just guess and say, hey, one of them is 12, one of them is zero. I can't do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put little stars. This is what I like to do. I put stars next to it, and I put a star next to the statement that has the 12. I'm not going to cross it off so that later I know to come back, and then um, I know that the stars have to add up to 12. If you like x and y, you can put down x, y, and then x plus y equals 12. You can do that as well. But let's keep going. We know that 25 eat blueberries. Again, we know nothing about the apples or the cookie situation. So let me just, uh, uh, oops, sorry, one second. What did I do? Just trying to get rid of these highlights. They let me. Okay, that's close enough. <laughs> okay, so 25 eat blueberries. So we start from the beginning. I know nothing about apples, meaning I have to consider both branches. A and A complement. But now I know that I can go towards just the blueberry branches. So again, there's two of them. I don't have to go down to cookies because they didn't mention anything about cookies. So technically, if I want, I can highlight all of them. But I'm going to stop right there because they told us that 25 eat blueberries, meaning that these two branches should add up to 25. And I already know that one of them is 17. So I can use that to find the missing one. So 25 minus 17, that leaves us with 8. So this branch has to be eight, and we've dealt with this 25. Okay. All right, continuing on this last number, 16 eat both blueberries and cookies. So I need to highlight the branches with blueberries and cookies. So starting from the beginning, I already have this highlighted. I have to go to A and A complement because I didn't mention anything about apples. Then we go down blueberries. Then we go down uh, cookies. And I know that these two numbers have to add up to 16. Well, one of them's already a 10. So guess what? We can fill up the other one by doing 16 minus 10. So that's six. So cross off the 16. And now the only number we haven't crossed off is that 12. And I know that the two stars have to add up to 12. So I can find the remaining star. It has to be six as well. Okay. All right. Now really quickly, let's fill out the rest of the table together before we answer the question. So starting with the 82, see if I can erase some of this. For some reason it's not letting me. Oh well, we'll just do that. Um, starting with the, that was 40, right? 82, 40 of them went down to A complement. So the rest of them should go up to A. So that's 42 goes up to A. Oh my God, these branches are disappearing. Sorry guys, I don't know what's wrong with my PDF today, but let me just fill them back in. I hope I didn't accidentally erase anything. Okay, and then keep going. So out of this 42, eight of them goes to B, the rest has to go to B complement, so that has to be 34. And then starting with this eight, six goes up to C, two has to go down to C complement. And then the 34, 6 goes up to C, uh, C. That means 28 goes down to C complement. And we can fill out the rest of the table as well. So this 40 splits off into B and B complement. 17 go to B. The remaining, 23, has to go to B complement. And then we can fill out these last branches as well. 17 breaks up into 10 and 7. 23 breaks up into 3 and 20. Okay. So take your time with this. If you have to each branch, make sure it adds up to the branch before. Okay, now we can look at what the question is asking. It's asking how many of the children eat exactly two of these food items? Now, exactly two means I can't eat three. It's two, that's it. So out of the two items, I can eat apples and blueberries, but then I can't eat cookies. Or I can eat apples, not blueberries, and then I'm allowed to eat a cookie. Or I cannot eat my apple and then eat blueberries and cookies. So those are the three ways to eat exactly two of these food items. So I need to go down all three of these branches. So the first one is A, B, C complement. So A, B, C complement. 
that's this number two. Then we have A, B complement C. So A, B complement C. Sorry, this is getting a little messy. Probably it will look better on your sheet because you can actually point to it and erase things. And the last one is A complement B and C. So A complement B and C. Okay, so I've circled three numbers there. We have two plus six plus 10. Adding those up, we get our 18. Okay. Part B, I want you guys to try this one. How many of the children eat apples or cookies? I'm gonna open up a poll for you guys. Apples or cookies? Remember, or means everything in both of them, okay? So figure out which branches those correspond to. Don't double count. Apples or cookies. So everything that's in apples, everything that's in cookies, but don't count the duplicates. I'll give you guys about five more seconds, maybe. Okay, I'm closing the polls. <laughs> and it's closed. Okay. So apples and cookies, right? Or apples or cookies, sorry. So if I go down these paths, I'm going to use pink now. Apples, that's this right here. If you wanted to, you can go down all the way to the end terminal points and circle those four points. But we know that everything that's in this part is already counted in 42. So I'm just going to look at the 42 for simplicity. Then I want to circle all of my cookies. That's this, this, or it's getting messy, this, and this. So there's four numbers that correspond to C's. But two of them are already included in the 42, so I'm not going to add them. So I'm only going to add my 42 for apples plus my 10 and my three that are for cookies that are not already counted in the 42. Okay. So then in total, that's 42 plus 10, which is 52, plus three, that's 55. So the answer here is C, okay? Tricky, tricky, big tree diagram questions. All right. Now let's take a look at, um, question three here. I'm going to do part of this question with you. I, this is a really good practice that I want you guys to try and the, the solution is quite detailed. So I'm going to start it with you and then I'll have you guys try the rest on your own. So here it says G is a set of all Western students who wear glasses. So that's one set. F is a set of all first year students. That's two sets. And H is a set of students in health science. That's three sets. So I see three. I don't care if there's four or five or more. If there's three, I know it's a tree diagram. So let's start drawing our tree diagram with G, G complement. And we have F, F complement, F, F complement. And then our third one is H. So H, H complement all the way through. Now this question is a little different. They didn't give us any numbers at all. Instead, they said, okay, there's this person, Josh. Josh is a second year student. So if he's second year, that means he's not in first year. So that's F complement. Studying health science. So he's in set H who doesn't wear glasses. So that's G complement. So that means that Josh is in F complement intersected with H, intersected with G complement. 
And the question is asking which one of the following sets is Josh not in? So first of all, let's figure out where he belongs in this tree. Organizing this in the order of our tree diagram, we have G complement, so that's down here. We have an F complement, so that's down here. And then we have an H that's right here. Okay, so Josh is in this last, uh, the second last branch down here, G complement, F complement, H. Okay, and we have to go through each one of these and figure out which one does not include this branch. So if I look at part A, we have G complement union F. Remember, that's everything that's in G complement. So everything that's in here, meaning including all of these branches as well, tag on everything that's in F. So F meaning that this branch here is an F. Of course, F breaks off. So all of these highlighted branches are in G complement union F. And of course, that covers our Josh, which is in the second last branch here. So Josh is included right here. So is included. So that is not our answer. Okay. And I'm going to leave this as an exercise. I know this is not complete, but I want to move on to the next step. And I want to give this to you as a practice. On your own, you're going to draw out the rest of these. So you can erase whatever's on your page and then, or draw a new tree if you want to, highlight the other branches that represent B, C, D, and E, and then see which one does not include Josh. Okay. I'll leave it as an exercise. Um, the full solutions will be sent to you. But let's move on to the next part of trees, which are something called decision trees. Your textbook and your profs don't usually make the distinction between counting trees and decision trees. Some profs do, but not a lot do. Decision trees are different. Counting trees, remember, for the most part, we had numbers on each branch, right? Decision trees don't have that. So when do we use decision trees? We use decision trees when we are, uh, when the question is asking for a number of possible outcomes, like if you're playing games or sequence of games, or if the number is asking for the number of ways for you to do something. And the most common question they have on past tests is making change. How many ways are there for you to make change for 350 or $4, stuff like that? In that case, you're gonna use a decision tree. Let me quickly go through the decision tree. It's very similar to a counting tree. You start here, and then each stage represents a decision. So the first decision, when I say decision, it could just mean, could, could just mean like how many choices you have, okay? There's two options, A and B. There could be more. If there's more, you keep drawing lines. But in this example, there's two options. Second decision, if I got to A in my first decision, then there are three options. But if I got to B, then there are only two options. So you see how the decisions don't have to be symmetrical like a counting tree, it doesn't have to be that way. And then you keep going. So for each decision you made, it will bring you to a next stage. So each stage represents one decision and each branch represents a possible outcome or a possible choice for that decision. Now, if I'm looking for, if I'm looking at a full path, for example, I start here and I go A, C, H, that represents a possible end outcome, meaning that to make the first, second, and third decision, or first, second, and third way to do things, I chose to go with A, C, and H. So then the total number of possible outcomes in this whole tree would be the number of terminal points. So if I count them here, this is a terminal point, this is a terminal point, D is also a terminal point because there's nothing after it, J is a terminal point, K is a terminal point, G is a terminal point. So for this particular example, this decision tree, there are six possible outcomes because there are six terminal points, okay? So let's actually take a look at an example of how to use this tree because decision trees, they're not symmetric. They don't always look like this. They can look bigger, smaller, messier, cleaner. So let's actually look at a question about making change. This is a common question that I've seen on past tests. So it says, in how many ways can you make change for 550 if you have the options of choosing from toonies, $2, loonies, $1, and quarters, 25 cents. So assuming you have like a bag of toonies, bag of loonies, bag of quarters, you can pick as many as you want from each bag. You just have to make up 550. So they're asking for the number of ways to do something. So it's not a table, it's not a counting tree, it's a decision tree. Remember at the beginning I said, this course is all about drawing out diagrams. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna draw a decision tree. 
the decisions we have to make are how many coins are we going to take from the two dollar bucket how many coins are we going to take from the one dollar bucket and how many coins are we going to take from the quarter bucket to give to this customer to make change so there's three decisions here first decision is the number of two dollar coins second decision is the number of uh, one dollar coins and then the third and final decision is the number of quarters and if you are given a make change question on the test which is quite likely always start with the highest coin first don't start with the quarter don't start with the one always start with the two dollar it'll make your life so much easier okay okay let's start drawing our tree so the number of two dollar coins how many two dollar coins can i give this customer if the change needed is 550 think about it Well, I can't give him more change than he needs. So I can't give him three $2 or four $2, for example, that's too much. The most I can give this customer is two $2 coins. That will make up $4 worth of change. I can also give him one $2 coin, which will make up $2 worth of change. And a lot of students forget this one. They forget that they can choose not to give him any $2 coins in which case we're at a total of zero dollars in change. Don't forget that zero case, a lot of students forget. Then depending on which decision you made for this first stage, we're gonna move on to the next one. If you chose to give the customer two $2, so that's $4 in change, well, I can give him at most one $1. I can't give him more because then I'll be giving him too much money. And then again, don't forget the zero case. I can give him zero one dollars as well. Okay. If I gave him one two dollar coin, well, I still have three fifty in change that I need to make. So the most I can give out for loonies would be three one dollar coins. I can give out two, I can give out one, or I can give out zero. And then finally, if I didn't give out any change in two dollars, well, then I have choices. I can give out five, four, three, two, one, or zero. So notice that the decisions for the $1 coins depends on the decision for $2 coins. And then now I'm looking at my third decision, which is the number of quarters. Now be very careful here. If I already have you know, a certain amount of money I gave the customer, I'm down to my last choice, quarters. And I have to make up 550. I can't give him more, I can't give him less. I have to make up 550. So really, I just have to give him as many quarters as needed to get to 550, right? There's really no choice there. I just have to give him as much as needed to get him to that $550 and change. So notice that each of these branches is just gonna correspond to one choice. Because I only have one choice. I have to give them as many quarters as needed. So that means that there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve terminal points. And I didn't have to figure out what the numbers are on the last decision because there's only one choice for each. Okay. So there are 12 different ways you can make change for 550 using these coins. Oh, that one's a tedious one. I personally hate decision trees because it takes so long to draw them out. If you have questions, let me know. But we have about 20 minutes left. We might go a little bit over, I apologize, but um, I do want to cover 1.3 with you. The good news about 1.3 is actually it's very similar to the tree diagrams, but instead of drawing a tree, we're doing it a quicker way. So let's dive into 1.3, which is on page 13. And again, I apologize for the first and second weeklies. There's going to be a little bit more information, a little bit more content, just because I'm trying to catch you guys up from the first couple of weeks. 
So 1.3 is something called the fundamental counting principle, or what I like to call counting with decision slots. So this is what the principle says. It's really clunky, but it says if there are A ways to do something, so for example, if there's eight ways to do something, and there's B ways to do another thing, so for example, there's 10 ways to do thing two, and then C ways to do thing three, then there are A times B times C that many ways to do all of things one, two, and three. Sounds really wordy. But instead, think back to your tree. I could draw a tree diagram, but that's really messy. So instead, each decision, I'm going to draw a decision slot, meaning a line. So for the first decision, second decision, all the way to the last decision. Then I'm going to put the number of possible choices or number of possible outcomes for each, each decision on top of that line. So for example, if there's three decisions for the first, uh, sorry, three choices for the first decision, I don't know, four choices for the second decision, 10 choices for the last decision, I just put those numbers on top. So I just made those numbers up. It doesn't have to be three, four, and 10, whatever numbers of possible outcomes there are. And then I'm going to multiply all of those. And that gives me the total number of ways for me to do all three things or all 10 things, however many decisions you have to make, okay? And this is where um, those keywords come back to help us. Remember those keywords, and, but, both, overlap, share, those keywords were all intersection keywords, right? It turns out that when we see those keywords, most of the time we are going to multiply. And this applies later on when we're in chapter two learning about probability as well. And then the words or, or at least one, this means union. In unions, we add, okay? So let's take a look at an actual example, a small example, just to get this concept down. So we have a restaurant serves three kinds of drinks, two types of appetizers, and five main courses. In how many ways can you order a meal that has a drink, an appetizer, and a main course? So ask yourself, is this two sets? No, not two sets. Is it three sets? Well, you might be thinking, okay, drinks, appetizers, and main, are those sets? But they're telling you, they're asking you in how many ways can you do something? So that is actually your decisions. So in this case, we're actually gonna use decision slots. So I have one decision for my drink. I have to make another decision for my appetizer. And I have to make another decision for my main course. Now we fill it up with choices. For my drink, how many choices do I have? Well, there's three kinds of drinks. For the apps, there are two types of appetizers. And for the main, there are five main courses. So the total number of ways in which I can order this meal is three times two times five. So that's 30. So that's how decision slots work, okay? In part B, in how many ways can you order any one item off the menu? So ask yourself, how many decisions are you making if I'm only ordering one item? Put yourselves in the shoes of the person in the question. So if you're at this restaurant, you want to order one item. You just have to make one decision, whatever it is you want to order. And how many choices do you have? Well, there's three drinks, two apps, five mains. In total, that's 10 different things you can order. So you have 10 decisions or 10 choices, okay? Of course, they're going to step it up and make it a little harder. The questions that you're going to see on the test um, are going to involve restrictions. So they're going to add restrictions to things like, oh, how many ways can you order this meal if you must order a vegetarian dish or something like that? So they'll, they'll, they'll give you restrictions. Some tips for you for a restriction is if you can, you want to break the restrictions down into non-overlapping cases. And then you'll figure out the number of ways to do case one, number of ways to do case two, and so on, and then add them together. But as you're thinking about cases, if you're like, wait a second, Jess, there's so many possibilities. In that case, do the complement, meaning the opposite. So what you're going to do is you're going to find the total number of ways to do something without restrictions. That's usually easiest. Then you're going to minus the number of ways to do the complement, to do the opposite. Okay. It'll make more sense when we see some examples. So let's dive in. But those are two tips. Use cases or use complement. So in this question, we have a regular six-sided red die 
and a blue dice as well. So there's two six-sided dice and they're being rolled at the same time. How many possible rolls are there? So you might be thinking, Jess, I'm not making a decision. This is just by chance. When I say decision, it could be decision, an intentional decision, or it could be a decision by chance as well, okay? So it's a quote unquote decision. So the decisions here, there's actually two of them. There's the red dice and there's the blue dice. Help me out here so we can speed this up a little bit. How many choices or how many possible outcomes are there when I roll the red dice? How many different outcomes can I get? Rolling the red dice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Yep. All right. Ah, someone's already done the question, thank you. So for the red dice, I'll just stick with one for now. There are six sides on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Those are the numbers. So there are six possible outcomes for the red dice. Same thing with blue, six possible outcomes for the blue dice. So in total, that's six times six, which is 36. There's 36 possible rolls when I roll these two dice together, okay? Part B, how many possible rolls are there where the red dice shows an even number? So now I have some restrictions. So I have red and I have blue. The red dice has to be even. So I have the options one, two, three, four, five, six, but I can only show an even. So how many options, how many outcomes are there? Well, it's either a two, a four, or a six, right? So that's three outcomes. Yes, thank you. And then blue, there are six. So three times six, that's 18. Okay. Now let's step it up a little bit. I'm gonna use these keywords that you'll see a lot in these questions. How many possible rules are there where the sum of both dice is at least 11? When you see the word at least or at most, be very careful, usually you need cases here. So the sum, meaning I'm adding the two numbers on the dice, for it to be at least 11, there are two possible cases, right? Case one is if the sum is 11, or at least 11 means it could also be bigger. So I can have a sum of 12. I can't have anything bigger because the maximum total I can get on two dice is 12, six and a six, right? So there's two possible cases. When I have cases, I'm going to end up adding them. So let's figure out case one. For me to get a sum of 11, for my red dice, I can either get a six and then the blue dice will have to be a five or I can swap those. So it's a five and a six, which will give me 11 or a six and a five, which would give me 11, that's it. So there's two possible rules. And then a sum of 12 is even more restricted. There's only one way for me to get a sum of 12. That's if the red and the blue dice both have a six on it. So there's one way. So when I add them, there are three possible rules that can make this happen. Okay, so when you see at least the word at least or at most, usually that's cases. So let's look at part D here. How many possible rules are there where the sum of both dice is at least four? Again, we see this word at least for thinking cases. So ask yourself, what does at least four mean? Well, it means minimum four, right? So I can have a sum of four, I can have five, I can have a total of six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's a lot of cases. I don't wanna have to write down that many cases. This is when complement really, really is helpful. If you're listing out too many cases, do the opposite, do the complement. So the complement here, the opposite of at least four, well, if I want a number to be at least four, meaning four and above, the opposite of that would be smaller than four, right? So smaller than four, meaning I can have a sum of three, a sum of two, Mm, that's about it, right? I can't have a sum of one because when I roll two dice, the smallest I can get is a one plus one. So that's it. So now I only have two cases there. But remember, when you're using this complement strategy, you need to figure out the total number of rolls without any restrictions. And then we're gonna minus the number of ways to do the complement or to do the opposite, okay? 
So total number of possible roles, we already calculated that in part A. There's 36 possible roles, right? Minus the number of ways to do the opposite. So number of ways to get sum of three and sum of two. Well, a sum of three, there's two ways to do that. You either roll a one and a two or a two and a one on each dice, right? So that's two ways. Plus a sum of two, that's, that's even more restrictive. There's only one way to do that. You have to roll a one and a one. So using the complement is a lot faster than you counting out each of the cases. So now you have 36 minus three, which is 33, okay? So I would say questions like these might be a little bit too easy to show up on the test, but it's to illustrate what to do when you see these words, at least, at most, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, just for time's sake, I'm actually going to skip this question. This question here, I want you guys to try it on your own. The full solutions will be sent to you. But I want to do number three, because number three is very, very, very popular. Like this type of question is very popular. Um, profs love to ask these types of questions on tests and quizzes as well. Okay. So on page 16, number three, so we have a three digit number. This is what I was talking about in the beginning of the course. When you see the word digits, you are thinking zero, one, two, three, all the way up to nine. It's pretty much the keys that are on your phone. You have from zero to nine, that's it. There's no 10, it's just zero to nine. So those are digits, okay? So you have a three digit number and it is to be formed using only odd digits. So I can only have odd digits, meaning one, three, five, seven, and nine in my number. In how many ways can this be done if the numbers must contain at least two different digits? So I see the word at least, I'm thinking, okay, let's count out the cases here. At least two, meaning I could have two different ones, or it can have three different digits. But it's actually more complicated than you think. Let's actually write it out. Case one, if you have two different digits, you also have to ask yourself, which two? <laughs> I have three digits, so three numbers to form a three digit number. Do I want the first two? to be the same and the last one is different? Do I want the first and the last one to be the same, the middle one's different? Or do I want the last two to be the same, the first one's different? You see how there's actually cases within this case, which makes it really complicated. You could do it, you could brute force it and, and figure that out, but I'm listing out more cases than I would like. So instead, I'm gonna try the complement. Okay. if your prof, especially Vicky, like I said, she, she's been this co the coordinator for years. She doesn't try to trick you. So if she's giving you a question where you're listing things out, you can do it both ways. You can actually list all the cases or you can do the complement. She's usually gonna do the more straightforward case and those are the answers you're gonna see on the multiple choice. So another hint is if you look at the answers, a lot of them have a minus sign in between. Minus means complement, right? Because we're doing the total minus the complement. So that's another good hint that we should be looking at the complement instead. So let's look at the complement. We have to think of what does the opposite of at least two different numbers mean? What's the opposite of at least two different numbers? So if I have a three digit numbers, I don't want it to have at least two different digits. So we talked about it before, at least two different digits means it can have two different digits or three different digits. The opposite of that is that it has no different digits, meaning all the digits are the same. So the opposite is all the same digits. Okay. Now we're using our decision slots because we're asking how many ways are there to do this. So I have three, different digits, three different numbers, and I want them all to be the same. So my first digit, how many choices do I have? Well, I have to pick from only odd numbers, right? Only odd digits. So that's five. 
And then my second digit, well, they all have to be the same. So once I've picked my first one, I don't have a choice. If I pick my first number as the number seven, I only have one choice for my second digit, which is I pick the number seven. And then I only have one choice for my third digit, which is I pick the number seven. I have no choice here. So that means that there are five uh, ways for me to form this three digit numbers that have all the same digits. And then now for the complement, I need to do the total number of possible three digit numbers using only odd numbers minus the complement. So the total, well, if you think about having three digits here, if I have no restrictions, I just need them to be odd numbers, that will be, I have five choices for the first one, five choices for the second digit, five choices for the third digit. So that's five to the power of three minus the complement, which is five. Okay. So these types of questions are common. Ask yourself, are there cases or can I use the complement to make it easier? And then use your decision slots, one decision for each digit. They like to use this for license plates, stuff like that as well. So it's one decision for each character. Okay. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but we only have one small section left. And it's not the hardest section once you understand the decision slot. So let's quickly cover that. We have subsets. So what is a subset? Again, I'm thinking back to shopping. When you think subset, you think shopping. So you have the set S that has a lot of things in it, apples, oranges, bananas. A subset is a set that contains nothing, or it can contain some of the things or all of the things from S, okay? So if I have the subset, for example, A, B, and C, an apple, a banana, and a cookie, I'm going shopping. I can choose to buy any of these things, some of these things, or none of these things. So one option is I can have an empty shopping cart, nothing in it. I can choose to buy only one thing, so I can buy an apple, I can buy just a single banana, or I can buy a cookie. I can choose to buy two things, so that's apple and then a banana, or an apple and a cookie, or a banana and a cookie. Notice I'm not listing B, A, C, A, or C, B, because the order doesn't matter in a shopping cart, right? If I have an apple or a banana, banana or an apple, same thing. And finally, I can choose to buy everything that's in the set. So they're not gonna ask you, don't worry, this is super tedious, I know, but they're not gonna ask you to list subsets. They never do that. Instead, they're gonna ask you how many subsets are there from the set S. So for example, if there are 10 things inside S and they ask you how many subsets of S are there? Well, you have to ask yourself for each thing you're going shopping, right? So for each thing in S, you can say, hey, I'm gonna buy it or no, I'm not gonna buy it. So it's kind of like Shakespeare here, to include or not to include, okay? So for thing one, I have two choices. Thing two, I have two choices. Up to thing 10, I still have two choices. So multiplying them all together, it's two to the power of 10, okay? That's why in class, you see that in general, oops, in general, we have two to the power of N that many subsets. You've probably seen this formula in class. I don't like to go with formulas because they usually try to trick you a little bit on the exam in terms of adding in restrictions. So I don't use a formula, I use the decision slot method, okay? Okay, let's look at some questions. Uh, if you really have to go, if you have class, feel free to, to leave. Um, I will send you the recording and solutions, but I only have like three small questions to go over and that's it, okay? So hang in there, stay with me. I know it's getting late. So question four, how many subsets? So when I see subsets, I'm thinking shopping. How many subsets of the set S are there? And if you look at S, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things inside of S. I'm going shopping. Each thing I can choose to buy or not buy. So I need to make nine decisions, right? Oh, what am I doing? I'm not gonna draw out all the lines, but there's nine decisions, one for each thing. And each thing, there are two choices, two options. I can buy or not buy them. So in total, that's two times two, nine times, or two to the power of nine. 
And that's a straightforward question. You might think, okay, that might be too straightforward. No, I've seen questions exactly like that on the test before. So if they're nice, they'll give you a straightforward question, but sometimes they'll change it up a bit. So let's look at how they can change it up. Question five, let you be the set of letters that appear in the word pizza. How many subsets does you have? I love this question and I use it with all my students in my tutoring sessions. A lot of students would go, okay, it's subsets. So we're thinking shopping. So let's see here. We have P, I, Z, Z, A. So that's five things. Each thing I have two choices. So a lot of students are like, okay, that's two times two, five times, that's two to the power of five. And a lot of students will choose that and that will be wrong. Don't do that. This question says, let you be the set of letters. So let's actually draw out you. Remember, I'm always saying, okay, try to draw it out so you can visualize what's happening. You is the set of the letters inside pizza, inside the word pizza. So we have P, I, Z, Z, A. What is wrong with this set? Can anyone see what's the problem with this set here? Thank you, yes, yes, everyone's paying attention, yay. There's two Zs, we can't have that, they, they can't duplicate. So I'm gonna cross one off. So realistically, there's only four letters, P, I, Z, A, and I need to make decisions for each one. So two times two times two times two, it's actually two to the power of four is the correct answer. Okay, so don't let that trick you. If there's duplicates, don't include them in the set. Okay, last one, bear with me here. So how many subsets of the set S, again, we counted this earlier, there are nine things inside this F, uh, inside the set. How many of the subsets contain at most one vowel? I see the word at least, I see the word at most, I'm thinking, I need some kind of cases happening here. So case one, what does at most one vowel mean? How many vowels am I allowed to have if it says at most one vowel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could have one, that's at most one, but there's another case that a lot of students forget. At most one, Yes, also includes zero because zero is less than one. So at most one just means that I can have, I can't have more than one, okay? So in this case, case one is we have zero vowels. Case two is we have one vowel. So let's look at the zero vowel case. Looking at the non-vowels, what are there? There are six, I think, right? Six non-vowels, A, E, I are the only vowels here. So since there are six, well, each one I need to make a decision to include or not to include. So that's two decisions each or two choices each. So since I have six non-vowels, this is two to the power of six. Okay, the one vowel case. Well, I have options as well. Out of the vowels, A, E, and I, I have three options, right? A, E, or I. So if I picked A, then again, out of all the non-vowels, I need to make the decision. Do I want to include them or do I not want to include them? So that's two, 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 two to the power of six. That's if I chose the vowel A. If I chose the vowel E, it's the same thing, right? All the other non-vowels, I have the same number of ways to pick them. So that's two to the power of six. And then the last vowel I, again, two to the power of six. When I have cases, I add them all up. So I'm adding two to the power of six, two to the power of six, two to the power of six, two to the power of six. So I'm adding it four times. That's the same thing as saying four times two to the power of six. Okay, so slightly trickier there. Make sure you try these out, try out the homework. We will send you the uh, recording and the solutions to all the questions that are in this booklet, okay? I'll stick around. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask me. I'll, I can answer them. Make sure you have my email so that if you run into problems, you can ask me. 
and you'll get an email for signing up for next week's tutorial as well. Please bring a friend, bring two, three, as many friends as you can, because the more people we have, the more likely we can continue to run these weekly tutorials for you. Okay. All right. I hope to see you guys next week. And if you haven't filled out the survey, please fill it out. It will really help me out. Have a great night, everyone. No problem. Glad I was able to help. If you have feedback for me, fill out the survey or send me an email. I'm happy to uh, hear from everyone. No problem. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, oh, question. Uh, are we doing the weekend test prep? Yep, there's going to be a separate, um, it's three hours, three hours test prep uh, for the first test this weekend. And that is specifically um, targeting test-like questions. So here in the weekly tutorials, I go through each question, each topic a little slower. On the um, In the test prep, I'm focusing on doing tons of questions with you guys to get you guys used to the test, okay? Um, oh, this question. Oh, good question. Um, so why is it two to the six and not two to the seven for this one? Did I miscount? I'm trying to see. Okay, so out of the nine letters, because we agree there are nine letters here, right? A through I, count them up. There are three vowels. So A, E, and I are the vowels. And then there's six non-vowels. So in my first case here, technically, if you wanted to, you could put in lines for A, E, and I. But there's only one choice for these ones. We, we don't have a choice. For the zero vowel case, we're not including it. That is our decision. So there's one choice, which is don't include it. One choice, don't include it. One choice, don't include it. So that's why there's three of these ones. And then there's six twos. That's why it's two to the power of six. And then for the vowel case, if you want to, you could actually add in the line for, um, again, A, E, I. So if I have the lines for A, I have to squeeze it in <laughs> E and I. For the case where I am including my A, there's one choice, right? I'm including it. For my E, there's one choice. I'm not including it. For I, there's one choice. I'm not including it. And then there's six twos that I have the dis I have the choice to include or not include. So that's why it's two to the six. Okay, let me know if that makes sense. If not, I can try to explain. Yeah, awesome. Great, great, great. Um, 